All right, hi, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County. I'm gonna be talking to you today, today about greenhouses and high tunnels, other protected structures that we can grow our plants in. And so a lot of this presentation is gonna be about greenhouses and hopefully I'll be able to spend some more time on high tunnels and cold frames and other things like that in future presentations. Uh, so when we talk about protected structures, there's all sorts of options and we'll define these as we go. Uh, of course, the, the classic is the greenhouse. Uh, then we have high tunnels, uh, which is essentially a, a, a kind of like a greenhouse. It just doesn't have any active ventilation or active heating. Uh, low tunnels, you can see a picture of those there. Kind of like a high tunnel, but low to the ground and just over that one row. Uh, cold frames and hot beds uh, are used to start off plants. And of course, because it can be very hot and very sunny down here in the, the south, uh, often we do uh, think about shade houses as well as areas to kind of actually reduce the amount of light that our plants are getting. Uh, but I'm gonna spend a lot of time today talking about greenhouses uh, and greenhouses are, are really beneficial uh, because they allow us to control the temperature uh, through either using uh, heaters during the winter or evaporative cooling uh, systems uh, during the, the heat of the summer, uh, allow us to, to use that space and garden year round, uh, whether it's freezing outside or really, really hot, uh, we can still get engaged in that. And, uh, the size and complexity of greenhouses varies exceptionally broadly uh, from small uh, sort of kit greenhouses that you can purchase, uh, that, something like what you see in that top picture, uh, which you can get in the range of $350 or $500. Uh, oftentimes you can order them and have them shipped to you uh, to very large commercial structures. Uh, that may cover acres uh, and, and cost many, many thousands of dollars uh, and really anything in between. Uh, and so as I talk about different topics related to greenhouses, I'm going to try to hit uh, the, uh, the sort of the hobby greenhouse side of things uh, and talk about doing things on a really small scale, uh, as well as addressing kind of how things may be done on a larger scale as well. Uh, and there are a lot of different kinds of greenhouses out there. Uh, you can see greenhouses, all sorts of different shapes. Uh, the, the most common shapes that I run into uh, are going to be the, the Quonset style. Uh, and you can see that in the figure uh, where it just has a rounded top. Uh, and the, the sort of the, the other most common one is going to be a gable roof. And you kind of think of that as being house shaped. Um, and, and those are really the two most common uh, that you'll run into, but all sorts of different shapes are available. You can see A-frames or slant-sided greenhouses. Uh, Gothic arch uh, greenhouses are also, per, are also fairly common uh, and really just kind of a modification of a Quonset hunt style greenhouse. It just gives it a little bit more, uh, a little, a little bit more strength in the structure. Uh, now on the scale of a, of a hobby greenhouse, if you wanted to purchase, uh, if you wanted to build one yourself, uh, there are a lot of plans for hobby greenhouses that you can find uh, on the MSU Extension website. And I've included the link here. Uh, you'll find that in the PDF of this presentation as well. So you can click on that and, and go right to the, the design plans uh, so that you could build one of these greenhouses. So, as we're talking about greenhouses though, you know, one of the things we really need to consider is where we're going to put it. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we put our greenhouse in the ideal location for it uh, so that it's getting the right sunlight it want, wants because uh, that, that location is really going to determine what direction the light's coming from, how intense that light is going to be, uh, as well as in addition to that, uh, the susceptibility of the structure, you know, if you're going to have any potential for storm damage, certainly a consideration down here in South Mississippi. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that it's somewhere where it's easy to access. 
uh, easy to get in there and manage the plants that you have. Uh, but generally speaking, the ideal location for a greenhouse on your property is going to be on the south or southeastern side of the house or of the property in a sunny location. Uh, and what that does, and you can kind of see the, the difference between uh, the angle of the sun uh, during the summer and during the winter uh, in the image there on this slide, uh, that during the, during the winter that the sunlight's going to be coming in from that angle. And that's really going to ensure that you're capturing the most sunlight from November to February. And that, that's when we're going to be getting the most use out of that greenhouse in terms of trying to keep that temperature up. Uh, that's when we have less sunlight. So we really want to make sure uh, that we're capturing as much of that as we possibly can. Uh, if you can't put it on the south side, try to put it on the east side. Uh, that's going to kind of be your, your second best option. Uh, and ideally, we, we don't want to put that over on the northern side of the house. Uh, again, just you're, you're going to wind up with a lot of shade uh, and just not capturing the sunlight that you need. Uh, that being said, particularly down here in the south, uh, it, it may be beneficial, beneficial, particularly during the summer, uh, to have a little bit of shade. So if you have some trees around the greenhouse uh, that are leafed out in the summer, but lose their leaves in the, the fall and in the winter, uh, that can actually be of benefit, gives you a little bit of extra shade in the summer when those greenhouse temperatures are gonna be really high, but the leaves fall down, let sunlight through in the, the, the winter uh, so that you kind of get the best of both, both possible worlds there. Uh, another thing you want to consider uh, is how you arrange your uh, greenhouse in space. Uh, and ideally, what we want to do is we want to arrange it so it lies north-south, uh, because that's going to give it less shade. You're going to get more light than one that lies east to west. In a north and south-oriented greenhouse, shadows kind of move as the sun moves. Uh, so the sunlight's going to reach all the different areas of your greenhouse. Uh, if it's an east-west house, the shadows basically stay in one spot and are going to cover the same areas of that structure all of the time. Uh, and so not all of the plants are going to be able to get all of the sunlight. You want to really, you know, greenhouse is going to be a, a, a important structure on your property. You want to make sure that you're getting all of the benefit of all of the space that's inside of there when you're raising your plants. Uh, of course, you know, next in a location, we need to consider your greenhouse size. Uh, and uh, in conversations with my significant other, um, I will, uh, she will often, uh, you know, every time I talk about building a greenhouse, she you know, says, you know, every time you talk about it, uh, it gets bigger. Uh, so uh, you, you reasonably do want to, uh, get a, a greenhouse that's going to be as large as possible for the location and for your budget. Uh, a part of that is that we as uh, gardeners tend to continually accumulate plants. Uh, and so if you build it for the size that you want right now, you're going to find that you accumulate more and more plants uh, and you're going to wish that it was a little bit bigger. Uh, one thing that you also want to consider with that uh, is that if you're going to, you know, if, if it's going to be in sections, uh, it, it's important to start with the right width. It's a lot easier to add some length to your greenhouse uh, than it would be to add width. You don't really have to adjust the structure. You can just add on some more, uh, and that works out perfectly fine. Uh, when you're considering the, the width, think about how you're going to lay out benches in the greenhouse. You know, if you're going to have benches along the side, uh, those are going to be about three foot. Uh, generally speaking, you need to be able to reach all the way across them. If you have benches in the middle, they're going to be about six foot, uh, so you can reach them from either side. So think about how you're going to move around in the greenhouse, where those benches are going to be, uh, and also consider, you know, how many plants are we planning to put in there? So uh, if you're talking about plants that are in six inch pots, uh, those are going to take out take up about a square foot of bench space. So if you have a hundred of them, you know you need a hundred square foot of bench space. 
Uh, when you're figuring out that size, just you know, keep in mind about two thirds of that space that you're gonna have in there is going to be bench space. About a third of that needs to be walkways and aisles and space where you can move around in there to actually work with your plants. Uh, it is a, a good idea as well to think about how you're going to be moving around in the greenhouse and what you're going to be doing. Uh, if you're going to be bringing in a wheelbarrow or thing, something like that, you need to make sure those aisles in there are going to be of a size that let you do that. Uh, height can be a little bit more variable, uh, really depends on the plants that you want to grow. Uh, so uh, the, the height to the eave or the uh, kind of the corner there is going to be uh, really important. Uh, so, you know, if you have low growing plants, you know, five foot at the eave is perfectly fine. Uh, if you want to grow a tall plant, though, you're going to want to make sure that you include space for it to grow. So you may need six or seven feet. Uh, and then you can determine the actual height of the greenhouse uh, by the, the angle of the roof up to its top. Uh, now, what greenhouses get made of can be very important as well. Um, you know, we're gonna start off with kind of the traditional material that greenhouses get made of, that's glass. Uh, and, you know, one of the really chief advantages of glass in my, in my mind is that it just looks great. It, it is a very attractive material. You know, the, the greenhouse looks very classical. Um, there are all sorts of designs that can be used. Uh, and there are, you know, there, there's a lot of growing area uh, because that glass construction just really uh, is fairly freestanding. Uh, glass is really effective. It's, it's not going to transmit heat very well. Uh, it's going to retain humidity, and, and you can get small prefabricated gr glass greenhouses uh, for do-it-yourself installation. Uh, now, some disadvantages of glass, uh, of course, you know, sort of the obvious thing uh, is that glass is fairly easy to break. Uh, I've done that several times working in greenhouses over the years, uh, breaking panels, and then they, they can be uh, uh, quite expensive to replace. Uh, and, and that sort of mentions the, the other side of thing that glass as a material for greenhouses uh, tends to be very expensive. Um, and the sort of, a, we, we don't often think about it, uh, but glass is actually quite heavy. Uh, and because of that, you really need a good strong greenhouse structure to hold that glass material up. Uh, so all things that you wanna think about uh, certainly very attractive, but also very expensive uh, and potentially is going to require replacement from breaking. Uh, one thing that I don't mention here, you know, if you, if you don't break the glass, uh, then that glass is going to last a very long time. Uh, another really common material uh, for use in uh, greenhouses, and I, I don't know if the image that I've selected for the slide really gives it its due. Um, because I, I really do think fiberglass greenhouses work really well. Uh, fiberglass is going to be lightweight, it's strong, uh, it's not going to have that same problem uh, with being broken easily uh, like you would experience with glass. Uh, what you do have to watch out for is that if you get a poor grade of fiberglass, as time goes on and as it's exposed to UV light, that fiberglass material will discolor it'll stop allowing light in as much. Uh, also just doesn't look very attractive. Uh, so you need to make sure when you're, when you're building a fiberglass greenhouse uh, that you get a higher grade of fiberglass that's not going to have that problem of discoloring in response to UV light. Um, oftentimes, you know, you're, you're really going to be paying almost as much uh, for this fiberglass as you would for glass. Um, you don't want to use any colored fiberglass. Uh, so you're, you're not really going to save a whole lot of money. The, the advantage that you're going to have is that, it, again, it's going to last a very long time um, and it's going to be more resistant to damage than you would see in a glass greenhouse. Uh, now they do sell Teldar coated fiberglass. 
uh, that blocks out that UV light so the material stays clearer for a longer period of time. Again, you're gonna see that be a little bit more expensive. Uh, and interestingly, we'll, we'll need to talk about, um, you know, if you have any uh, pollinators inside your greenhouse, uh, the lack of UV light can be an issue as well. A uh, very common material that is used for greenhouses, particularly in hobby greenhouses, uh, are film plastics. Uh, one of the, the chiefest advantage of them is that the cost per square foot uh, is significantly lower uh, than for the other materials. So you might be paying a tenth of what you might pay for a glass greenhouse. Um, in comparison with a glass greenhouse, they, they retain heat just as well. The, the plants that you grow in a film plastic greenhouse are going to be just as good as the plants that you would grow in a glass greenhouse. Uh, and there are different materials uh, that fall into this category, uh, either uh, polyethylene or polyvinyl chloride. Uh, polyethylene, it, polyethylene is generally going to last for one to three years, kind of dependent on the type that you have. Uh, PVC or, or polyvinyl chloride will last maybe five years uh, before it needs replacement. Of course, with either of these film materials, they can get torn. Uh, even um, you know, high wind events can damage them and, and, and lead to them requiring replacement. Uh, polyethylene, uh, really low in cost, stands up in the weather, lets plenty of light through. Uh, it will deteriorate in the summer, so you know, all of the heat and high light intensity uh, is going to require it to be replaced more often. Um, and it does lose heat a little bit more quickly than a glass greenhouse uh, during the sunny period, during, uh, during after sunset. Uh, for us down here in the south, losing a little bit more heat during the day uh, is actually an advantage. It's okay that they're uh, not retaining all of that heat during the hottest part of the day. Uh, though you know, losing heat during the summer can, be, or during the, the night, or when it's already cool, uh, can be a, a little bit of an issue there uh, in using this kind of greenhouse. Um, PVC, again, uh, it's going to cost a good bit more, uh, but again, it is going to last longer. It tends to attract dust, so it needs to be washed every now and again. Uh, of course, you do need a foundation. Uh, if you're going to have a glass or a fiberglass uh, greenhouse, uh, you essentially need the, the same kind of uh, foundation you would have for a house. You need a good permanent foundation there. So. Uh, a lot of your home greenhouses are going to need a concrete foundation, uh, just the same as your house would. Um, if you have something a little bit more basic, like a Quonset greenhouse, uh, just using pipe frames uh, and in plastic cover, you, you basically just have posts that are driven into the ground uh, and you don't have to have that, that entire uh, you know, structure of a foundation. Uh, flooring is very important. Um, I, I recommend against permanent flooring. Uh, you know, concrete floors look really nice, um, but the second you get water and soil media and other things on the floor of that, uh, they become very slippery uh, and, uh, and can be a little bit of a problem because of that. Uh, so most of the greenhouses that I've worked in over the years have gravel floors. Uh, I think that works really well, suppresses any weeds that you might have. Uh, you can actually spray that in, uh, spray water into it to increase humidity uh, inside the greenhouse if you want to do that. So uh, make sure you have a good walkway uh, wide enough for what you're going to do in there. If you're just walking, maybe two foot is enough, uh, but certainly wide enough for any tools that you're going to need. Uh, and then again, covering the, the floor with gravel will be very good. Um, as uh, just a, a good flooring for the remainder of the greenhouse. And you'll occasionally see uh, other kinds of, of flooring, uh, possibly, you know, but they'll always have that drainage there uh, to, again, prevent slipping and prevent water standing inside the structure. Uh, temperature control in a greenhouse, kind of the, the whole point. Uh, what we generally are looking for is, is keeping those temperatures above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the plants that we're putting in there, 
uh, you know, particularly during the winter. Uh, we're doing that for cold protection. So having, you know, keeping that temperature above 40 degrees uh, is really important. Uh, I do want to just include the note, you know, depending on what kind of plant you may be talking about, you may need to keep the temperature a little bit warmer. Uh, and ideally, we want to keep the maximum temperature at around 85 degrees. And here in Mississippi, you may find that more of a challenge uh, than keeping it, uh, keeping it warm in there. Um, the minimum night temperature is what it, what's important. Uh, and then the ideal daytime temperature. So on a bright, sunny day, uh, what we really want is to have the day temperature about 10 to 15 degrees higher than what it is at night. Uh, if it's really cloudy or dull out, uh, a difference of five degrees is about what we're looking for. Uh, and we want to keep in mind, it's very likely that temperature is going to vary in different areas of the greenhouse. We can try to distribute air as best we can, but there are all, always going to be warm spots and cold spots. So where you put individual plants may need to take into account those little microclimates that show up inside the greenhouse. Uh, ventilation is very important. Uh, you can see uh, uh, on the top there the, that hand-operated roof vent. Uh, that's just going to let that hot air out, and uh, you need to open that uh, during the day, close it in the evening very often. Uh, very often those are just going to be hand-operated. You go in there and turn a crank or, or push it up with a stick, uh, and that just allows you to open it. Some of them are going to be operated in, in a little bit fancier greenhouses. Uh, those are going to be operated by the, the temperature controls. But without some ventilation in that greenhouse, it can get so hot uh, that you may have injury to plants or can actually kill the plants. Um, if you can get an automated ventilation system, they're, they're great. They take all the manual work out. Uh, and they really are the best way to control temperature and humidity inside your greenhouse. And so they're just set to trigger at a particular temperature. Uh, at this temperature, the, the, uh, the louvers or the vents are open and the fan turns on. Uh, it just helps you keep the temperature within the range that we're aiming at. Uh, and having that ventilation is really important. Uh, and generally you wanna have a, a, a big enough exhaust fan to be able to change out the air in that greenhouse uh, about one and a one half times every minute. Uh, so there's quite a lot of airflow through there uh, that's helping you keep that space cool. Uh, one of the very common forms of cooling that are used in greenhouses is an evaporative cooling system. Uh, sometimes people call these swamp coolers. Um, but you can see in the top image there, they have that panel along the side of the wall. Uh, and the greenhouse has got an opening on the other side, and uh, water is trickling down into that matting. Uh, and so on the other side of the greenhouse, what you don't see is the fan system, uh, and the fan will draw air across that, that wet surface. And as the hot air interacts with it, it evaporates some of the water, which cools down that air. Uh, you can see, you know, the temperature drop 20 to 30 degrees in response to these evaporative cooling systems. Uh, and down in the bottom image, just for a, a kind of interest, uh, that's a picture of a homemade version of the same thing. Uh, you can see the fans and the mats there. Uh, and again, it works the exact same way. Uh, that fan is pushing air across that mat, uh, which causes that... Uh, evaporation which cools down the room that it's in. Uh, of course the other side of that is heating uh, and there are a, a number of different heating systems that are used in greenhouses uh, on the really small scale and the really simple scale. Um, ordinary space heaters just with an electric fan uh, to distribute that warm air around the structure uh, are going to work just fine. Uh, if you're using a, a gas-powered or kerosene-powered uh, space heater, uh, you want to make sure that you avoid you know, low-quality kerosene. It needs to be high-grade uh, to avoid problems with generating sulfur dioxide uh, that can be damaging to plants. They also have electric versions of these uh, or propane versions of them that work just fine. Uh, just make sure um, you need to have a good fresh air supply. 
uh, needs to be able to, you know, need to be conscious that you have ventilation in there. So carbon monoxide or, or other uh, problems aren't uh, showing up inside the greenhouse. Uh, kind of on the other end of that is a forced air heater. Uh, that's going to be usually a gas powered heater. Uh, really a very good system. Uh, usually they'll have that channeled into a tube that runs down the length of the greenhouse and then distributes that warm air all throughout the structure so that it's evenly distrib dist distributed. Uh, what you'll also see in that bottom image though, if you look around about the middle, uh, those circles are fans that are continually circulating the air inside that greenhouse that really help distribute the, the hot and cold air around uh, so that you don't have those cold and, and uh, colder hot spots inside the structure. Uh, just to go even kind of a little bit more primitive or uh, uh, on it, there uh, uh, is a lot of interest in using compost as a heating uh, system for greenhouses. Uh, has been used for a very, very long time. Um, uh, so this is kind of an example of a, a little bit more advanced form of it. Uh, of course, this relies on heat from active compost. Uh, that compost, while it's working and really in a good thermophilic stage where those materials are breaking down, uh, can be 180 or so degrees. Uh, and so the system runs water through the center of that compost. It heats up that water. Uh, and then the water is, is pumped through the greenhouse. You can see in the top image there, uh, just attached to the bottom of the tables that the plants sit on. Uh, and that warms them up and, and keeps the greenhouse warm and, and the plants warmer. Uh, of course, you know, you need to make sure if you're going to do this that you have enough material uh, that you're going to be composting to keep that working, to keep that temperature up. Uh, and of course, if your compost starts to, to cool down, uh, you're going to have that same problem inside your greenhouse. Uh, kind of an interesting way to approach it. Uh, another thing just to kind of uh, mention that I've seen people do in, in small greenhouses uh, is just to include barrels of water because, because water takes so much energy uh, to freeze it or to thaw it. Um, having that water tends to moderate the temperature inside the greenhouse just a little bit. Uh, of course, you know, we're, we're having greenhouses. We want to make sure that they, they get good light, uh, but shade is, can be important too, uh, particularly during the really hot, really sunny part of the year. Uh, and shade for greenhouses can be made of different materials. Uh, it can be, you know, sheets of wood, so essentially fencing, uh, aluminum or, or vinyl plastic shading. Uh, it can be paint on materials. Uh, Roll-up screens are available they, you know, with pulleys where you can uh, just kind of pull them up and pull them down. Uh, that's uh, kind of an attractive way to approach it uh, and easy to, uh, to modify. Uh, the uh, shading that you can get out of that, maybe 55 to 65 percent, uh, easy to install. Uh, another uh, kind of classic way to do this is, uh, is whitewashing. Um, so uh, compounds basically applied on the outside of the greenhouses, um, you know, to lower temperatures and drop down the light intensity. Uh, and you'll see either white or green material used to do this. Usually I see white material being used for it. Um, some people, you know, th there is a, a specialized product that's used for this uh, that you can get from greenhouse uh, distributors, um, greenhouse stores. Um, I've seen some people who try to use essentially just latex paint to do this, uh, and I really encourage you to use the material that's designed for this. Uh, it's going to be a lot more effective for you. Uh, supplemental lighting is really worth its own presentation. There's just a lot of material uh, that can go into this. Um, at, the, at the hobby end of the scale, uh, and, and perfectly okay for a, a small scale greenhouse uh, are just fluorescent lights uh, like we would you know have in my office here. Um, you know they they have the advantage they don't really generate a lot of heat uh, so we can really put them right down on the plants without overheating them and 
Uh, they last, you know, their, their lifespan is okay. They generally last about 10,000 hours, uh, and that's measured till they, you know, lose their efficiency. Uh, you don't often see these used in commercial greenhouses uh, because the, the structure of the fluorescent light takes up a lot of space, uh, and because of that, it kind of shades the plants. But in a home greenhouse, uh, using a fluorescent light is perfectly okay. Uh, larger scale or, or a little bit more expensive uh, would be the high intensity discharge lamps. Uh, those are either going to be metal halide, which look blue, uh, or probably more commonly high pressure sodium lamps. Uh, that's a picture of one that down there on the bottom. Uh, they tend to last uh, two to three times the length of time that you would get out of a fluorescent lamp. Uh, they do generate some heat, however, they need to be raised up, but they're smaller. Um, so they do not, uh, they don't shade the area as much. Uh, what most things are moving to is an LED uh, lamp. Uh, you know, it, initially those were very, very expensive, uh, but they are becoming more affordable. Um, and it's really easy with these LED lamps to target the spectrum of light that the plants really need for photosynthesis. Uh, and that spectrum can vary at different times in plant development, different times of the day. Uh, and with LEDs, you can modify all of these factors to really give your plants the exact light that they require. Um, they don't really produce any heat. Well, they do produce heat, but they produce heat in the opposite direction that they produce light. Uh, so again, you can put them down close to the plants. Um, and they can last again two to three times or even five times as long as what you would get out of a fluorescent light. Um, still for you know, hobby growers and hobby greenhouses, uh, LED plant grow lights tend to be relatively expensive um, and, uh, and can be a little bit out of reach uh, unless you're uh, really dedicated to getting that light system into your greenhouse. Uh, to move, uh, you know, move on from greenhouses a little bit, just talk about high tunnels a bit. A uh, high tunnel basically is a um, unheated greenhouse. So all of the heating and cooling that happens in a high tunnel is achieved by raising up the sides of it. Uh, and you can see there in the image, the, the end raises up and the sides are raised up. And that allows ventilation uh, to cool down the area inside of that. Uh, but when you want to increase the temperature, you can lower down the sides and lower down the front, uh, and that will raise the temperature inside that high tunnel. Uh, and temperature differences, you know, air temperature differences, will generally, you know, maybe about 10 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in air temperature and, a, you know, difference in soil temperature as well. Uh, and what that allows us really to do is to plant earlier in the spring and maintain plants for longer into the winter. Um, uh, so you know, rather than having our planting date where we're looking at the first frost, which may be you know, sometime towards, you know, in my area, towards the tail end of March or very start of April, uh, you can plant as much as a month earlier. Uh, and out of the high tunnel where I, I grew the tomato plants that you're looking at, um, I was harvesting, uh, uh, tomatoes uh, after Christmas into the into the following year when I planted in the fall, so they can be very effective at maintaining uh, maintaining plants uh, throughout the year. Uh, one of the real advantages of high tunnels is that they cost a lot less uh, than a, a greenhouse of a comparable size. Uh, you can see that generally you're you're paying somewhere around seventy five cents to a dollar fifty per square foot including the plastic and the frame structure uh, with a little bit more uh, for the end wall and, and for site preparation and water lines and everything else. Um, generally speaking, high tunnels are not considered to be a permanent structure. Um, so you don't have to worry about your tax base increasing uh, by adding a high tunnel on your property. Um, and they do a really, you know, they do a really fantastic job again of allowing you to plant earlier and to, to maintain plants longer uh, inside that structure. Uh, 
Uh, kind of the same idea as a high tunnel is a low tunnel. And you can see um, you just have plastic covers that are, that are supported right above the crop. Uh, you can use uh, wire hoops. Uh, that works really well. Uh, or just as you see in the picture there, you know, even PVC pipe that's been bent to, uh, to the right shape uh, can support that, uh, that low tunnel. Uh, and so uh, very often uh, they'll, uh, they'll cover over those plants, uh, you know, protect them uh, during the early part of the year, also provides good protection against insects or, or disease because it just kind of excludes all of that. Um, and again, raises the temperature inside that low tunnel uh, so that you get some acceleration in growth. Uh, and I, I didn't mention this when I was talking about high tunnels, but you will see in high tunnels, the plants, because the temperature is increased, you'll see an increase in the vegetative growth of the plants because of that increase in temperature. Uh, now with low tunnels, uh, very often, uh, because you're getting the greenhouse effect inside of there, very often you are going to need to open them up during the day uh, to prevent heat stress. Uh, and then, you know, you, you're putting those in at the early part of the season or in the fall, the late part of the season, uh, and then removing them as we get into the hotter part of the year. Uh, and, of course, we do need to keep in mind that with a low tunnel, you're, ex you're excluding your pollinators. Um, so if you, know, if you have a plant that requires a, a bee as a pollinator or something else, uh, you need to make sure that the low tunnel is removed uh, when the first flowers appear so that the pollinators can get there. A cold frame is, is kind of a temporary structure or a, a temporary for the plants anyway. Uh, it is a protected plant bed. There's no artificial heat here. Uh, it's just using the effect, uh, the greenhouse effect, um, to, to heat the temperature inside of it. Uh, and we generally use this to harden off seedlings or start cold tolerant plants um, and, and just give them an easier start to being out in the environment. Uh, just a really simple structure, uh, very easy to put up the side of things or, you know, build it out of uh, old... Uh, uh, old windows or old screen doors and, and works very effectively. Uh, a hot box is, is just a heated cold frame. Uh, usually, uh, basically, it's a miniature greenhouse that just has a very small amount of space. Uh, and often these are going to be heated by compost uh, or by you know, putting an electric coil in there. Uh, but essentially, you have the, the, the ground that is the the base of the, the hot box. Over that, you put a layer of manure, that's your composting material. And over that, you put some soil and then you put your plants in there. Uh, and then the structure of the hot box, in addition to the decomposition of that manure, provides the heat for the structure. Uh, just like uh, uh, with a greenhouse, generally speaking, our hot beds and our cold frames want to have a southern exposure uh, to get the maximum amount of sunlight. Uh, you can provide a heat break um, uh, on the north or the northwest side. Uh, you can do that, you know, either with a building or bales of hay or, you know, evergreen hedges, uh, anything that's going to block the wind a little bit. Uh, and again, you know, this really doesn't need to be a complicated structure. Uh, my favorite version is what you see there in the picture uh, with some bales of hay and an old screen door. Uh, works really well as uh, as you know, this kind of structure. Uh, just uh, you you want, do want them to be level with the soil. Uh, hot beds need to be dug down again because we're going to need to to include space for that manure in there. Uh, and again, using either manure or an electric coil. I uh, just want to add some notes at the end of, about some other uh, issues for for uh, greenhouses or, or high tunnels. Um, and for that matter, cold frames and hot boxes. Uh, all of these environments, there are some insect pests that are favor or kind of favored by these environments, or at least very common to have outbreaks of these particular pests inside these structures. Aphids being the, uh, the probably the most common. Um, you're, uh, we're all very familiar with them, um, uh, with their piercing, sucking mouth parts and producing honeydew on the plants. Uh, the kind of sticky material, uh, also really important uh, as transmitters of virus diseases of plants. Uh, 
Uh, and so it's a really good idea to, you know, just like we would have a monitoring plan for the rest of our uh, landscape, we do want to watch out for buildup of, of different insect pests inside these structures uh, and make sure that we manage them very quickly. Uh, with aphids, neem oil, or insecticidal soap applied to the plants is very effective. Uh, generally in the greenhouses, we have smaller plants, so relatively easy to apply. Uh, very similarly to aphids, they're white flies. Uh, again, they have piercing sucking mouth parts. They're sucking out the sap of the plant and produce honeydew, uh, sticky material on the plant. Uh, and like aphids, they transmit a number of plant diseases. Uh, white flies are very easy to detect because little white flies will be all, all around your plant. Uh, and we're going to control them fairly similarly with neem oil or insecticidal soap. A uh, really important thing for white flies is that because the adults are so mobile, um, often what we're doing is we're getting rid of the immature uh, white flies by treating the plants, uh, but we will still see some of the adults flying around. Uh, so it's going to take some time to manage them. Uh, and even if we've successfully managed them, it's going to take time for those adults to go away. Uh, mites can be another problem. Uh, they're really favored by high temperatures and by dry conditions. Uh, and so inside protected structures can be a really ideal location for them. Um, you know, we want to avoid any unnecessary insecticide applications. Uh, and you can control them very much the same way. Uh, the most common one is going to be the two-spotted spider mite. You see that in the top picture there. Uh, and they're, they're so small, it's really, really difficult to see them, see the individual mites. Uh, what we're most often going to see is that stippling that we see on those bottom leaves, uh, just little yellow spots. And that, that's a really good sign that you're developing a mite population. If that population gets really high, you'll actually see webbing on the plants that's generated by those mites. Uh, and they, they can be fairly difficult to manage. Uh, less commonly, we have thrips. Uh, the, the most common type of thrips is the western flower thrips, uh, and they tend to feed very much the same way. We don't have the same issue with developing honeydew uh, because of thrips feeding, uh, but you can see the damage that they do to the leaves there, and they'll also damage fruit as well. Uh, so uh, one way to just detect them, uh, because again, they are quite small, uh, is to take a cloth, piece of cloth or an index card, tap the uh, uh, plant onto it, uh, and you can really easily see the thrips on that white background. Uh, and you can treat for them much the same way as you treat for these other insects. Uh, just be aware that because of the raised temperature inside a protected structure, um, you're gonna tend to see the, the populations of insects increase a little bit faster than you would out in the, the rest of your garden. Uh, so it's important to get in there and, and check around and make sure you don't have these. Uh, or if you do have them, catch them when the population is small and a lot easier to manage. Uh, just a, another quick note, uh, the uh, um, sorry, let me go back slide there. Uh, because, you know, oftentimes I, I get asked about releases of beneficial insects into the home landscape uh, and, and generally releasing lady beetles or other insects that are, that are beneficials uh, into your landscape isn't very effective uh, because unless there is a population of organisms for them to eat, uh, then they tend to just kind of fly away and, uh, and go land in your neighbor's garden or uh, the garden a mile away. Um, because you have an enclosed structure, uh, it is a little bit more practical to actually, you know, release the beneficial insects. Uh, I don't know if, you know, necessarily recommend it for, for homeowners, uh, but a lot of times it's very effective in commercial greenhouses to control aphid populations or whitefly populations. Uh, and they'll use different beneficial insects like lady beetles, uh, as well as parasitic wasps, and you can see a picture of one of the uh, very small parasitic wasps, uh, as well as the minute pirate bug, which uh, feeds on aphids and white flies, other insects like that. 
of course, uh, just again, a, a note for more for commercial greenhouses than anything else. Uh, of course, uh, you know, if you're in a protected structure, uh, you don't have uh, pollinators coming in. Uh, so oftentimes they will introduce pollinators into, um, in, into the greenhouse. Uh, one of the most common ones is to release uh, or bumblebees. Uh, the bumblebees are really good pollinators. Uh, they tend to be in, in much smaller colonies than honeybees. They tend to be a lot less aggressive than honeybees. Uh, so they make really, uh, really good pollinators uh, for greenhouse tomato production and all sorts of other things like that. Colonies, uh, at this point, they, they've uh, figured out how to rear them. They, they can, they'll actually ship the honeybees uh, to the greenhouse producers so they can introduce those uh, into the, to the greenhouse, uh, let the uh, bees do their work. Uh, the colony lasts 8 to 12 weeks. Uh, and then does a really good job pollinating those crops. Uh, so with that, I appreciate your time today. Uh, I am going to take some time now to answer any